Okay, so today I want to start with, let's start with um, talking about identifying extrema. So we have a few different types of extrema that we see in, um, in calculus. Um, we see um, both local and global extrema. And in general, if you're looking to try and find global extrema, um, you're going to need a restricted domain. Um, and and for global extrema, sometimes that's the most efficient way to deal with it. Global extrema is nice if you have a restricted domain and you can identify all of your points on it. Um, then you can uh, typically, if the function is continuous and all of that, you can find an absolute maximum based on just plugging in numbers. Um, however, uh, sometimes it's not always. Um, it's not always reasonable to restrict the domain. Um, so instead, um, are we having uh, some issues? Is it still freezing for you, Ilsa? You can try leaving the stream and then rejoining it. That might cause it to refresh. Um, but it might just be a bandwidth issue. Um, this is part of the reason I'm recording. So sometimes it's not always reasonable to restrict the domain. So we need to identify um, local maximums and minimums instead. So, a while back, a, f a few weeks ago, um, we talked about the importance of critical points, right? And critical points, Can you hear me still, Ilsa? Okay. Um, I think maybe you should try leaving the voice channel and then um, joining it up again. So critical points are important. Um, they represent the place where the derivative can change signs. And if a function changes from increasing to decreasing, we get a maximum. Um, similarly, If a function changes from decreasing to increasing, we get a minimum. So being able to
being able to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing is enough for us to know um, basically when where a function has maximums and minimums, right? Um, so we get what's called the first derivative test. So one, um, identify your critical points. Two, for each region or for each interval, between critical points test a value in f prime of x and record the sign. Three, if f prime of x changes from positive to negative at x equals a, then f of x has a maximum, technically a local one at x equals a and if f prime of x changes um, from negative to positive at x equals a then f of x has a local minimum at x equals a. Are you still having troubles with the stream, Elsa? Or anybody else for that matter? Also, while I'm thinking about it, have I been doing less cutting out? Yeah, you have not cut out at all. Okay. The last few streams. Cool. Um... If we're having bandwidth difficulties, I can shut off my face cam, which will uh, make the video uh, at significantly smaller bit rates. I don't know if Discord will change that, but um, if we're having trouble with it in the stream, let me know. we can theoretically do that. So. so the first derivative test is relatively straightforward. Um, you're basically identifying your critical points and then you're making a sign chart in the first derivative. So. So for example, let's let f of x equal t times the cube root of t squared minus 4. So first we need to take the derivative of this function. <clears throat> it might be nice to rewrite this as uh, t times uh, t squared minus 4 to the power of 1 third. And then we need to do a product rule. So f prime of x will be the first I, there should be X's, not T's, sorry. Um, F prime of X will be uh, first X times the derivative of the second. That's a quick chain rule. So that'll be times one third of X squared minus four to the power of negative two thirds times two X 
plus the second times the derivative of the first. So x squared minus 4 to the 1 fourth, the 1 third, um, times uh, 1. The derivative of x is just 1. Uh, we probably want to simplify this a whole bunch because we're going to have to solve for this, right? So um, on the left hand or the left hand part of this is going to turn into two x squared divided by three times the cube root of x squared minus four squared. Um, plus the cube root of x squared minus 4. Actually, I think it's going to be easier to leave these as um, rational exponents. Um, x squared minus 4 to the power of 2 thirds. And this is to the power of Um, we're going to be setting this equal to zero eventually and solving. So I want to multiply this guy by um, 3x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds over 3x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds to find the common denominator, which will give us uh, 2x squared over 3 x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds plus um, 3 times x squared minus 4. It's the 1 third power times the 2 third power, so we're adding the exponents. 1 third plus 2 thirds is 1 divided by 3 x squared minus 4 2 thirds. Um, and when we combine these all together, we end up with, uh, I think it's going to be 5x squared minus 12 divided by 3 over x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds. So it was a bit of arithmetic. Um, it was a little bit messy, but we got to something that resembles a useful form, right? Um, we're going to have a handful of critical points. Um, we're going to have some critical points where the derivative is zero and some critical points where the derivative doesn't exist. So if 5x squared minus 12 is equal to zero, <clears throat> then... Um, x squared is equal to 12 over 5, which means that x is equal to plus or minus um, the square root of 12 over 5, which is about uh, plus or minus 1.549. If the denominator is equal to 0, that's 3 times x squared minus 4 to the two thirds is zero, then f of x is undefined. Um, and if this is equal to zero, then x squared minus four is equal to zero. So x is equal to plus or minus two. So we end up with four total critical points, x equals um, negative two, x equals negative 1.549, x equals positive 1.549, and x equals positive 2. So we're going to build a sign chart. Um, we have negative 2, negative 1.59, 1 1.549, 1 
nine and two. And then we need to plug in some things between our intervals, right? Um, so let's go ahead and pull up a handy dandy calculator, which is here somewhere. There it is. And uh, you know what? Let's just do this in actual Desmos, even though we could just graph it, it'll be easier. Let's do, um, let's plug our derivative in here. Uh, it'll be. Five n squared minus twelve divided by three times um, n squared minus four power of two thirds. Um, on the left hand side of negative two, we could plug in negative three, and we get a um, we get a positive number over here which means our function is increasing before negative two right to plug in a number between negative two and negative 1.549 we could plug in i don't know negative 1.8 or any of these will do um and we still get a positive number so we are positive here as well, which means that we are still increasing here. Uh, plugging in something between negative 1.55 and negative and positive 1.55, zero works. This is negative, so we're decreasing on the middle interval. And then we can plug in positive 1.7 and we get another positive number. So we're increasing. And then finally, we can plug in um, three to get a final positive number. Which means that we are increasing on the last part. Okay. So note, negative two and two do not give local extrema. The function could have changed, changed signs. But does not. However, at negative, or at x equals negative 1.549, we have a max. And at x equals 1.549, we have minimum. At one point, negative 1.549, we go from increasing to decreasing, so we have to have a maximum there. At uh, positive 1.549, we go from decreasing to increasing, so we should have a minimum. Okay. So this was um, a relatively complicated one of these. Um, we had to walk through a, a bunch of different steps, but we ended up um, putting all the steps together in our sign chart. And the sign chart essentially represents what the first derivative test is. Basically, with a first derivative test, what you're doing is you're taking your critical point and you're checking um, numbers in the first derivative on either side, directly to the left and directly to the right. And you're deciding is that it does it change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing or does it not change at all? The first derivative test is, um, it's pretty straightforward, but it's kind of bulky. Um, building these sign charts is definitely no 
um, small matter and it, it can be a lot of uh, it can be a lot of work to go through all of that so um, luckily there is a second test that is sometimes a lot faster um, but it's not always it doesn't always work unfortunately okay. so let's So the second derivative test also tells us whether or not a function has a maximum or a minimum um, at a certain critical point. So um, one thing to note that is that um, the second derivative tells us the concavity. So suppose f of x is concave up at x equals a, and additionally, um, f prime of a, <coughs> excuse me, f prime of a is equal to zero. So the first derivative at that point is equal to zero. What does this actually mean? What, what, what do we know about about the tangent line at x equals a? Any wild guesses? Shouldn't be wild guesses. Um, we have, we should have a couple of notes. It'll be positive, right? What do you mean by positive? Uh, the slope will be the slope of the tangent line will be positive. What's the slope of the tangent line? Ah, don't remember. Okay. The rate of change. The rate of change, and those are both given to you by what? The first derivative. The first derivative. And what's the value of the first derivative at a? Well, so, the value is zero. Yeah, so the value of the first derivative at a is zero. So um, we know that it has slope zero. Concave up tells us that the second derivative is positive, Cam, but the first derivative is zero, so the slope should be zero. Um, let's go back to the notes from yesterday. Um, what is the original definition of concave up? What does it mean to be concave up? The rate of change is increasing. The rate of change is increasing. Um, but we gave a definition that was graphical in nature. It had to do with the tangent line. The tangent line is below the curve. Yeah, so the tangent line and the tangent line lies below curve. So here's a graph, here's A, here's F of A. You've got this point here, and we've got this horizontal tangent line at A. And we also know that um, the function has to touch here, and it has to be in, in some region around A, the tangent line has to be below the graph, right? So 
our function has to have a minimum. All right, between the combination of slope zero, which means it's horizontal, and that horizontal line lies below everything nearby um, in the function, that's basically exactly the definition of what a minimum is, that uh, everything in an open region is greater than or equal to A. Okay. So, um, so basically what we get is we get the actual second derivative test, which is, um, so suppose that X equals A is a stationary point. of f prime of or of f of x um, that is x equals a is a critical point such that f prime of a is equal to zero And that f double prime of x is continuous in a region around x equals a. If f double prime of a is less than 0, then f of x has a maximum, a local maximum, at x equals a. If the second derivative, f double prime of a, is greater than 0, then f of x has a local minimum at x equals a. That looks an awful lot like a equals a. Thirdly is the unfortunate part. If f double prime of a it's two f's. f double prime of a the second derivative of a is equal to zero then we know nothing. So if it is true that if f double pro, or if, if f of x has a doesn't have a maximum or a minimum at this critical point, then the second derivative will be zero. But it is actually also possible for a function to have a minimum at a point and have the derivative be equal or the second derivative be equal to zero there. Okay. So for example. Let's look at the graph of x to the fourth. So x to the fourth, I hope everyone agrees with me, um, clearly has a minimum at the origin, at 0, 0, right? Um, it is decreasing before that point, and it's increasing after that point. So we get the minimum on the graph up there, right? But what's the first derivative? Um, the first derivative of x to the fourth is 4x four cubed, right? And the second derivative um, of x to the fourth will then be 12x squared. So at x equals zero, um, the second derivative is zero. Um, but there's a minimum there.
So in general, um, we don't know anything about what that point is if we know that the second derivative is zero. Um, it will usually end up being a neither, but usually isn't good enough. If you do the second derivative test and you get zero in the second derivative for the critical point you're testing, then you need to go back and you need to do the first derivative test instead because the second derivative test is inconclusive. I don't want this to scare you away from using the second derivative test. Okay, the second derivative test is frequently much, 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 much faster than the first derivative test, especially in a situation where, like, if you're dealing with some sort of a polynomial function, you have to have some real weird stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> in order for you to have an indeterminant um, thing happening, you have to have basically, like, the amount of things that have to occur for it to be indeterminate is very unlikely. And in most real world situations, i.e. optimization type problems, um, this won't happen. My first instinct in general when I'm finding maxes and mins is to go to the second derivative test, unless the second derivative seems like it would be a big pain in the butt to find. Um, the problem that we just did um, previously uh, with the first derivative test I don't know that I would have gone straight to the second derivative test um, because to do the second derivative, we would have had to have like a, we had had to do a quotient rule with a chain rule inside. It seems like a messy derivative. Um, but in many, many other situations, I will use the second derivative. You're plugging in less numbers and um, it, you don't have to draw the sign chart. It's a lot faster. Any questions so far? <clears throat> All right. Let's do a quick example of using the second derivative test, and then we'll move into some early optimization stuff. Let's um, use the second derivative test. To classify the extrema of f of x is equal to 3x to the fifth minus 5x cubed plus 3. So first off, we need to find critical points. Um, whenever you are looking for extrema, no matter what type of extrema you're looking for, local minimums or maximums, uh, relative minimum or abs global minimums and maximums, it doesn't matter. Step number one is always taking the first derivative and setting it equal to zero, finding those critical points. That is always the thing you are looking for, okay? Um, if you're trying to think of a place to start, um, you're, finding, you're finding an equation and you're, setting, you're taking the derivative and you're setting it equal to zero at some point, okay? With the optimization problem, something that comes up relatively often is people do all of the work to try and set up the problem, which can be kind of a pain in the butt. And then they forget to even take the derivative, right? Like they get stuck on that part. So the reason why we need calculus to do this is because the derivative tells us this information. So we'll take our derivative. We get um, 15x to the fourth minus 15x squared which factors as 15 x squared times x squared minus one, um, which gives us um, critical points at x equals zero and x equals plus or minus one. The second derivative, f double prime of x, is um, 
60 X to the fourth minus um, 30 X. So to plug in these points, we need to find, or to use the second derivative test, we're just plugging in these points. F double prime of negative one is um, 60 minus 30 times negative one. Is it 60 X to the fourth or 60 X to the third? It is 60 X to the third, thank you. That makes a lot more sense. So 60 times negative one cubed minus 30 times negative one, which is negative 60 plus 30, which is positive 30. F double prime of zero is zero. Um, it's 60 times zero minus 30 times zero. And F double prime of positive one is um, 60 minus 30 is all right this is negative 30 this one's 30. so the second derivative test tells us that um f of x as a maximum at x equals negative one, a minimum at x equals one, and is indeterminate about x equals zero. I think last class we did this using a sign chart and we found that it, it didn't change signs um, and that this happens to be the situation where um, x equals zero was neither a minimum nor a maximum. Any questions about these derivative tests? Um, why they work, how they work, how to apply them? Okay. If that is the case, then let's go ahead and jump into some optimization problems. So optimization is essentially taking these concepts and applying them to a real world situation. So um, there's a lot of optimization problems are a little bit like related rates. Um, they sometimes require a fair amount of geometric sense. Um, obviously I can't require you guys to memorize geometric formulas anymore because you know, I don't have that power with the internet. Um, However, it's helpful to sort of review them to try and remember like, okay, well, this is these types of shapes have these types of formulas just to sort of uh, make it a little quicker to get through them. Um, and much like, well, unlike related rates, often um, the geometry is so nice that it's very helpful to even just draw a picture. To be So <clears throat> the first thing I want to start with in optimization is an example. So we need to include, enclose, um, we're gonna build a garden uh, to prevent ourselves from going insane in the quarantine. And we have 500 feet of fencing. Um, and a building is on one side of the area we're building.
Um, what are the dimensions of the largest possible garden? So essentially what we're asking about is um, we have, ah, okay, I should, um, I should mention, let's say the largest possible rectangular. Um, you can do some crafty stuff with circles otherwise. So we're building a garden and essentially what we have is we have a building on one side. And we want to take our fence, our 500 foot of fence, so, and maximize the area. Um, so we're gonna need an equation for the area and an equation for the amount of fence that we use. So to start with, um, we probably want to assign some variables. Um, to me, because my brain works this way and everything looks like it's on a coordinate grid to me, um, I want to call the horizontal length X and the vertical length Y. If you would rather call these length and width, that's totally fine. It's up to you whatever variables you want to use. When you're doing these types of problems, however, try to be clear in your definition of variables. You either need to be labeling a graph with your variables or you need to be actually in a sentence defining what your variables are. And the area of a rectangle is the length times the width, right? Or X times Y. And the amount of fencing we're using is going to be, well, we're going to have to make one fence of length Y and then one fence of length X and then a second fence of length Y. So the total amount of fence that we're going to use is 2X plus Y, 2Y plus X. And we want this to be, in, in fact, um, 500 is equal to 2y plus x. Because the total length of fence we have has to be 500 feet. Um, for what it's worth, technically, this is a inequality, right? I guess you could use less than 500 feet of fence, but um, it should be relatively obvious that if you are using less than all of your fence, then you probably could have built a bigger area, right? You could just add a little bit of length somewhere and that would make your garden bigger. So we should use all of the fence in order to optimize our, our answer. So these two equations are called respectively the objective equation. and the constraint. Every optimization problem will have an objective equation, period. The objective is the thing that you're trying to optimize. We knew that our objective equation would be area equation. If we go back to the question, what are the dimensions of the largest possible rectangular garden? What we're trying to maximize here is the area of the garden, right? Um, in an optimization problem, your objective equation is always the equation that describes the thing that you're trying to make maximally large or minimally small, I suppose. The constraint is, or constraint equations are equations that are given to you, numbers that are given to you, right? In this case, we know that the amount of fence has to add up to 500 feet. So that's our constraint. That constrains the area that we can make. If there was no constraint at all, then our largest area could be infinitely large, right? 
we could just build more fence, right? We, we could go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and there'd be nothing holding us back. Optimization with no constraints is not a very interesting question. Um, optimization with constraints actually allows us to answer that question. Actually, optimization without restraints is a interesting question, but it's not one that we can solve just using Calc 1. <laughs> um, so it has more to do with like theoretical efficiency and so eh, whatever. Um, <clears throat> any questions about how I picked up these two equations? Okay. So at this point, what we really want to do is we want to take this objective equation, a is equal to x, y, and we want to find the maximum, uh, like a, a, a value that makes x maximal. Um, unfortunately, in order to do that, we need this to be written as a single variable. Um, we have too many variables happening right now. We could, there's some stuff you could, you know, you might be able to think about using like implicit differentiation, but it turns out implicit differentiation is not the right tool for this. Um, we would need actually um, partial derivatives and stuff, and that's not something that, that's a Calc 3 topic. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use our constraint to rewrite our objective equation. So we know that 500 is equal to 2y plus x. So that tells us that um, 500 over x is equal to 2y. When we divide both sides by 2, we get that y is equal to 250 over x. We can substitute that in for our area equation to give us that the area is x times No, that's not right. <laughs> it's 500 minus x. So y is equal to 250 minus x over 2. So x times 250 minus x over 2. Or, in other words, uh, 250x minus x squared over 2. And... Now, with this version of the equation, now we can take a derivative. So now we can find maximums and minimums. But which method should we use? Well, for optimization, um, generally, if you can um, optimize based on uh, global or absolute maximums and minimums, you should. But in order to do that, we need to make a closed interval. Um, and here, I think we can do that, right? Um, what is the smallest that x can be? Is there like a absolute minimum x can't be smaller than some number? Zero. Yeah, x has to be positive, right? You can't build a negative length fence. That's not possible, right? So we know x is greater than zero, right? Um, and specifically, x is greater than or equal. Uh, you could have a zero length fence. You could put up a fence that is just 500 feet of fence against a, a building. It's probably not going to be the thing you're looking for, but it's theoretically possible. Is there a maximum value of X? Two fifty. Oh, you know what? I think I did it backwards. Um, if x is equal to zero, then it's two 250 feet lengths of fences right next to each other going out from the wall. Because x is the horizontal, right? So that's on me. I led you astray. So it shouldn't be 250 for x. Uh, x should be maximally 500 instead, right? Um, and x has to be less than or equal to 500. So if x is greater than or equal to zero, or if x is equal to zero, then um, we have uh, our – 
if x is equal to zero, then we have two y's of 250 feet each. And if x is equal to zero, or if x is equal to 500, we have just one 500 foot length of fence. So since we know that x has to be in zero to 500, we have a closed interval. Um, we can use uh, absolute extrema. And we talked about this last class, but to do absolute extrema, we're going to find all our critical points. Um, we're going to find the endpoints, and we're just going to test all three of them and see which one of those gives us our, our biggest number. Okay. So we'll take um, A is equal to 250X minus X squared over 2. And we're going to take its derivative. So A prime is 250 minus x and when we set that equal to zero that means that x is equal to 250. so we can then test our three points um x and a so if x is equal to zero, then the area is 250 times zero minus zero squared over two, which is an area of zero. If x is 250, then the area is 250 times 250 minus 250, 250 squared over 2, um, which ends up being 31,250 square feet. I guess this is a kind of big garden, huh? Um, and then if x is 500, then we get uh, 250 times 500 minus uh, 500 squared over 2. And this also ends up being 0. Right. So. Sorry about this screen jumping around so much. I keep accidentally hitting the scroll bar with my pinky, which is very annoying. So it should be obvious at this point that x equals 250 represents a maximal. So if x is equal to 250, then we know that um, y is equal to 250 minus x over 2. That's our constraint rewritten to be a solution for y. We can plug that in. So y is equal to 250 minus 125. So y is equal to 125. So the largest possible garden is 250 by 125. And that's your first 
optimization problem. They get a lot harder than this for what it's worth. Um, this one is about as straightforward as optimization gets. Um, so before I leave you with some uh, with a problem set, um, I want to sort of real quick walk through a set of steps for solving optimization problems. So these are kind of loose steps, but they are sort of a good framework to be working around. So steps for optimization. First, I identify an objective equation and any possible constraints. So for this, you should be read the problem carefully. Um, the information is in the problem. So you need to read it very carefully and make sure that you understand exactly what is being asked, right? The objective is always the thing that you're optimizing. And constraints are given to you as numbers. B. Um, draw a picture. Many optimization problems have a really nice geometric thing. Do your best to draw a picture of the most, um, of like a generalized case and assign variables to that. Um, and you'll frequently use geometric formulas. So step one is to identify an objective equation and any possible constraints. Step two, use the constraints to rewrite the objective in terms of one dependent independent variable. Because we're not in Calc 3, we can't do multivariable stuff, you must be able to rewrite this as um, your, uh, you must be able to use your constraints to write your problem as a single variable for a function. Um, so in the case of the previous problem, uh, we use the perimeter constraint to eliminate the y from our area function. And we just had an area function solely in terms of x. Okay. Step three, take the derivative of your objective. This is the calculus part, right? This is the part where you're actually doing the things that we've learned in this class. Um, step four is find any critical points Step five, verify critical points using either A, identify a closed domain and use absolute maximums or mins. B, the first derivative test. Of 
course, C, the second of the test. And then finally, for part six, answer the question. Okay, if you were working for a construction, a construction company and your boss asked you to say, okay, well, we've got this much material, what's the largest thing we can construct using this much material? And if you went back to him and you said X is equal to 250, he would fire you, right? Like nobody's, nobody wants to hear that, right? They want to have an answer to the question that they asked. What are the dimensions of the field that will enclose the largest area? Um, what, is the, what is the volume of the largest cylinder? Right. So go back to the question and and look at that either probably that last line. It'll tell you what you are supposed to be providing as your answer, and you need to provide that answer. Um, you should also be providing that answer as a sentence. Um, it's likely that for your exam, I'm going to be asking for like paragraph style write ups on these sort of things, um, detailing your thoughts and how you got through um, this sort of a question and why you decided to take the steps that you did or labeling the steps that you did here and there. Um, <clears throat> but regardless, you need to answer optimization problems in the language that they were asked to you. Um, all optimization problems are word problems, so you should answer using words. So for step number six, go back to the question, figure out what it's actually asking, answer that question, okay? And those are the six steps that get you through basically any optimization problem. There is a little bit of a catch here. Um, it's always, step one is always actually really tricky. There's a lot going on in step one. Um, that's probably the hardest part of this whole thing is identifying the objective and the constraints. And that's the thing that you guys will need to practice the most. So, well, we'll we will be working on this for uh, at least one more class after this, um, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, and we will, make sure that everything is up to date. Okay. Um, any questions before I give you guys some assignment problems and then let you guys go? <clears throat> okay, so as usual, I will hang out on call until the end of class. So I will be hanging out in one of the voice channels. Uh, you can come join me and ping me if you have any questions, um, and I will be happy to uh, talk to you and walk you through anything. Um, and I will post uh, some problems for you guys to look at and work on um, in the uh, in the chat in a bit. Okay. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody.